Hi, Paul Hewitt here. Just as a teaching guide to a textbook is important for good teaching, this video of excerpts of my Conceptual Physics for Teachers workshop in Vancouver may serve as a teaching guide for Conceptual Physics Alive and for teaching in general. Enjoy! Hello and welcome to the Teacher's Edition of Conceptual Physics, presented by Paul Hewitt and created especially for high school teachers. Over the next half hour, you will see excerpts of material taken from different lessons that make up this series. Like a teaching guide that comes with a textbook, this series will give you many helpful tips that you can use in the teaching of conceptual physics to your students. You will get personal teaching tips taken from over 25 years of Paul Hewitt's own experiences in the classroom. You will get a better understanding of Paul's approach to teaching physics and the evolution of conceptual physics. You will also get stories that help to simplify the visualization of physics concepts while holding the attention of your students at the same time. Methods for increasing class participation and encouraging discussions amongst your students. Ways to incorporate illustrations from the textbook to use as overhead transparencies. Methods of organizing equations and drawings in your chalkboard discussions and simple demonstrations, many of them using materials easily available in either your classroom or home. I've been teaching conceptual physics now for a quarter of a century, and I've taken quite a while to develop a knack for this thing, and it works very well for me. And for new teachers, uh, maybe it's quite a challenge. Of course, you, you may know enough to know that teaching conceptually is much, much more difficult than solving problems and giving the answers, which is a fun, fun way to teach, by the way. But if you're committed to teaching physics, I think that you have to teach concepts because that's what people are weak in. And so I've evolved a style that I want to share with you. And the idea is, is that we teach the way we've been taught. So I'm the teacher, and guess what your role is? Students. Remember those days? You're back there. <laughs> and so we find out we're going to learn the rules, and the rules are those things that tell us how things are connected. And by the way, I only use the simplest examples. And if they learn the simple examples, then they're starting to learn the physics. You at any time as a physics teacher can overwhelm those students. And you know what physics is. Physics is called the killer course in most schools. Because all you've got to do is take that plow and push it way down there and you can wipe those kids out. But if your game is, hey, I'm willing to teach the unwashed, I want to get more kids to learn, to learn this stuff, then you're going to talk about what we're talking about now. And that's hitting the concepts because these concepts they can get. And I know oftentimes in a physics class, we'll spend the first couple of weeks going through vector notation, even uh, imaginary numbers and coordinate axes and all these things and radians. Oh my God, the kids are up to here. Distinguish it between Newtons and ergs and joules and all that. Ah, oh my God, this, this course, I hate it. My advice is wipe it all away. Good teaching is knowing how to sequence ideas. That's what it's all about. You, and it takes a lot of thought, and that's what, your, that's what your preparation is when you're making your notes. When I first started teaching, man, the amount of time I put into my lecture notes was enormous because I wanted one step to follow the next, the next, the next, the next, and that's very difficult to do. Notice, gang, I got equal resistances. Why? It's, simple. it's easier. If they can learn this simple stuff, I am happy. And if they can learn it without really straining themselves too badly, good, that means they're smart. And the ones that aren't so smart have to try harder. But by gosh, I want to get them all up so they can all do these practice sheets and all talk about this and all leave the course feeling they know something. You know how you have this thing where you're trying to get your students to save, to, to, to not put their numbers in until the last step, and they won't do that, and they start plugging numbers in right away, and you're wondering, how can I get them to wait until the last step and then put the numbers in, and everything you do won't succeed, and you don't know what to do about it? Get rid of the numbers. What's that say? How do you write density? Do you find density like that? You do? Make density like this. Or weight density, I'm saying here. Okay. How do you do Ohm's law? Do you do it like this? What's that say? Pressure equals current times resistance. Force equals mass times acceleration. 
I thought a force was a push or a pull. No, it's not. It's a mass times an acceleration. Oh, okay. This doesn't say anything. This says a lot. How do you get acceleration? By pushing. But it depends on what you push on. The amount of acceleration you get is the ratio of force to mass. The amount of density you have is the ratio of mass or weight to volume. And the amount of current you get is the pressure per resistance. So I'll write ratios. I love ratios. They're conceptual. They show you, you have a feel for it. And that's something I learned with Burl Gray, the principle of exaggeration. When you have a question greater than, equal to, less than, exaggerate what the difference is, and boom, you'll see the answer right away. You know, in the college book, I talk about electricity and magnetism first, and I talk about light. In the high school book, we do light first to get more with the phenomena that kids are used to and put the electricity, <coughs> which is more abstract, further away. But really, it's nice to follow light up with electromagnetic induction. And here I am, I'm changing the electric field, and I can't change that electric field without generating a magnetic field. The magnetic field changes, that generates an electric, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and there you go, and you've got light. Ooh, somewhere here I've got some practice things that you guys have never seen. Brand new. Um. You know what I'm supposed to be doing now pedagogically, you guys? Do you see I'm flubbing around here? If I'm going to flub around here, what should I do before I start to flub around? Give you something to do or ask you a question and ask you to check your neighbor. The check your neighbor routine in my teaching is the best thing I can say to do. My classrooms are the noisiest on campus. You come into the class and everyone's talking, 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 talking. In my role, I used to get up there and give lectures. And you, but I, I still do that to some extent. But a lot of it is throwing things out like a conductor. You know, you're, you're conducting and asking the kids to check and talk about things. And while they're talking about things, then you can look at your notes and see where you are. It gives you a little time to catch on. Or you can start to do stuff like this. This is a next time question. You post this in your glass case and you leave it. Your students ask you the answer, check their answers with you, and what do you do? Do you tell them the answer? The other homework assignment was, when I let these two balls go at the same time, which will win the race? The one with the greater average speed or the one with the less average speed? And at this point, I ask a question that will let me know who read the book and who didn't read the book. Uh, can I just ask this question? Is there anyone that came to class today that didn't sort of skim through the chapter on gravitation? <gasps> Four of you. Okay. <laughs> How many did? <laughs> look at the hands that didn't respond. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys, look at your hands. Which is bigger, your left or your right? Let's hold the hands up so they're further away. Arms length. Now which one looks bigger? Any change? About the same, yeah? Now, uh, what I want you to do is take one hand and hold it halfway to your face. Halfway. Now which one is bigger? How many people say, well, when I put one hand half to my face, it looked to me to be four times bigger? How many say, when I looked put up to my face, they still looked about the same size to me? About the same size. How many say, well, when I pulled it in about halfway, it looked to be half size? Now let's try it again, gang. We're all blessed with two eyes. OK, let's be handicapped for a little bit. Look with one eye. Close an eye and look. And bring it over and overlap it a little bit. Ooh. Ooh. One's halfway now. Is not the one that's closer twice as tall? Twice as wide? What's twice times twice? Inverse square law. So the hand that's closer to your face occupies four times the visual area of your eye. So your hand is four times bigger. Now, was that information overrode by your conviction they must be the same size? Take your hand and blow with your mouth wide open on your hand. Sense the temperature of your breath. Now do it again, but puck your lips up so the air has to expand when it comes out. And try it. Any difference? This is certainly equal mass to this. And where is my hand? It's not the 50 centimeter mark, mark, is it? 
it's right at half, be half between, right? So now I have the weight of the stick acting here. Are you guys hip to that now? The center of gravity of a meter stick, the center of gravity of this meter stick is at the 50 centimeter mark. Where's the center of gravity now? The 50 centimeter mark. Where is it now? Well, maybe not that angle, but how about this angle? <laughs> the 50 centimeter mark. That's the center of gravity of the stick. Do you guys know why a ball rolls down a hill? Gravity. <laughs> well, I don't have a ball here, but I got a, you know, my hill is an inclined plane. And I've got a can, okay? <laughs> and of course it goes this way. And that is because of anti-gravity, that's right. And then you can humba, 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 humba. And of course we have it like this. Yeah, a trick. There's always a trick. But in answering the question why a ball rolls down a hill, we could say a, a ball has its center of gravity ordinarily, or a tin can ordinarily in the center. And there's a force there. But your point of contact is over here as if you had a fulcrum. And what do we have right in here, gang? What's this? That's the lever arm. So a force times the lever arm produces a rotation. In this particular case, we had what? As the ball, as the can sits on the incline, we can say that the center of gravity must be somewhere right on this dotted line, probably right about there. What I like to do at this point is challenge people to stand against a wall and assume that l shape configuration, touch their toes, and come back up. And you'll find they can't do that unless they do as Dave Vasquez did that time. And Dave Vasquez uh, used long ski boots, extra long ski boots. When you go to touch your toes, your center of gravity assumes, say, over here, it's the same thing. Pull. Here's your greatest distance. So what do you got? You get a rotation because you get a torque. And over you go. We want to know how waves get through glass. How else could you explain it without using Newton's balls? How does light get through glass? Let's suppose you had an experiment where you had a tree and you had a high-powered rifle and you fire a rifle bullet right through the tree. And the rifle bullet hits the tree, slows down, and then comes out just as fast as it hit over here. Okay? No. That's not okay? No. And if that happened, would you say this has got to be a trick? And wouldn't you suspect if that happened, maybe the bullet that came in is not the same bullet that comes out in disguise? Maybe it's been sitting here all the time, and this one just triggers that one going out? Watch. This one that comes out is different than this one that comes in. And that's the way I look at light going through glass. Let's suppose it's blue light. Blue light comes down, boom, reflects. What color do you see up here? Blue. I have a blue shirt on. If I looked at my mirror image, what would the color be? What if I had a low frequency shirt on, red? What would the image look like? Red, very good. It turns out that frequency doesn't change when things reflect, when, when light reflects, right? So we see blue. But let's suppose now we have a water surface down here and a gasoline surface on the top. Some of the light reflects off here, but some goes down here and comes up. And maybe this extra distance is enough to cancel out. You hip that a wave like this and another wave on top of it will combine to give me a wave of increased amplitude. And you hip that if we have a wave like this and we have another one start and say right here, I'll get no amplitude. This is destructive interference. This is constructive interference. Well, over here, what do I got? Am I going to see my blue light? I'm up to my white belt, by the way. <laughs> see this great big log? See, four by four? Oak? No, hemlock, like the baseball bats, all right? Watch this, I don't want to hurt my hand. I'm going to break that right before your eyes. How about like this? <clears throat> no. I got to go like this. <laughs> Boom, like <laughs> splinters. You see that? Did you see that devastating blow? <laughs> Quick time or short time? <laughs> short time. Short time. Short time mean what kind of force? That's why I almost hurt my hand. And no, no matter how much force it takes to break that board, how much force will act on your hand? How many say exactly the same amount of force but in the opposite direction? Exactly as much? Exactly? P 
People that say exactly as much for, stand up. Stand up. I want to see who you are. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up and be counted. I believe in Newton's third law. So why is it when you're roller skating in the, in the roller skating rink and you fall down on the floor, you're okay? You go out in the street in Victoria Park and you skate and you fall down on the concrete, you get hurt. Someone says the floor got more give. Yeah. Which might say, why is it that when you fall on the floor with more give, you're less apt to be hurt? And then we come to Newton's third law. And Newton's third law is that, hey, I can't touch you without you touching me. You can't touch something without the something touching you back. I can't push on the table without the table pushing me back. I can't push against this without it pushing against me. That's the most I can bend my fingers. If I push against the lamp, ah, more. So what's happening? The lamp is pushing me over here. And you've got to get this idea that things can push even if they're not alive. If you push against the wall, the wall pushes back on you. In fact, you get to a whole new idea of explaining forces. Not pushes or pulls, but interactions between one thing and another. The Earth pulls on the moon. It can't do that unless the moon pulls on the Earth. And you know what the law is? The pulls are opposite and equal. There's my balloon, and my balloon sticks to the wall. But I've charged the balloon up. I rubbed it against my hair, and I rubbed electrons off my hair onto the balloon. Now the balloon is negative. Now I have over here, let's say, a wooden wall. Ooh, what's the electron going to do? Stay over this way more often or stay over here more often? It's going to be pushed over here. So now what I have is I have the positive closer to the balloon than the negative. Newton's law tells me that the force between things depends upon the distance. So one could say there's just as much force on here as here because there's just as much charge on here as here compared to over here. But closeness wins. This is closer than this. So this is attracted a little bit more than this is repelled. And this is one atom. You probably got four or five of them in there, or even more. Who knows, right? <laughs> you got scads of them. And those scads of atoms make it so that what? There's an attraction between the positive part and the, and the balloon, and the negatives are just pushed the other way. I like to say this one. You're playing golf with your friends. You've got your nice copper little spikes on here to put in the, in the ground like this. And you've got a nice copper rod with a point on the end of it. And friend says, we better get out of here. There's a lightning storm going to happen. You say, well, just one last one. And you pull up your club, and what happens? Your club goes up in the air like this. What does the cloud say? Santa Claus has come to town. Because now, now you've got a shorter thing, and bap, there you are, and you get struck by lightning. And many, many people get killed by lightning like that. Then you can talk about buildings. Why are the buildings more likely to get hit than the ground below? They're closer. See all the elements I have on the table here? Notice the nuclei, hydrogen, helium, lithium. I'm going to take the nucleons of those elements and shake them. I'll grab the proton, and I can get a, a feeling for how much mass it has, how much resistance to, to a change in motion. Now I come into the helium and grab one of them, and oh, it's easier to shake. That's interesting. Lithium, even easier still. And I find out that the nucleons are easier to shake as I progress up. I get up to iron, very easy compared to the hydrogen. And now we're here on the graph. And then beyond the iron, I find out the nucleons are harder and harder to shake. For some reason, there's more mass per nucleon as I go up the periodic table. Now we can talk about nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, and how it is that we get energy from these reactions. And we all know that in nuclear fission, what happens is a heavy nucleus, somehow or other, boom, divides. And when it divides, we say it fissions, divides into uh, roughly equal pieces. Ordinarily, nuclei will spit out an alpha particle or a beta particle, and we have these small changes in energy. But in this particular case, nuclear fission, a whole new ballgame. 